everyone. Welcome to the End Their Knowledge series. This is a platform for the industry to share their expertise, projects, products, information, and ideas um, to build the to fuel the discussion on NZ and uh, uh, grow the engagement for energy efficiency. This program is uh, implemented under the METRI program that is supported by USAID. METRI stands for Market Integration and Transformation for Energy Efficiency. So the METRI program focuses on three program areas mainly, that's energy efficiency in building. That's where uh, the focus on NDEVs comes in. Um, next is sustainable cooling and training and consumer engagement. Um, the program involves partnerships with several organizations to implement various initiatives. Um, so, um, METRI is supporting efforts moving towards a super efficient and net zero energy targets for buildings in India. The NZ Knowledge Portal is a one stop site for information on NZEB, and you may explore this further on the website www.nzeb.in. And the NZ Knowledge series aims to help you gain insights about energy efficiency, NZEB, and sustainability at large. I'm Sachi, and I'm the program coordinator for sustainability education at EDS, which is a global sustainable consulting firm. Today's topic is passive house standard for NZ in warmer climates. The passive house is a building standard based on building physics adaptable to different climate construction types as well as building types. And passive house buildings provide a pathway to net zero by ensuring comfortable and healthy indoor conditions at extremely low cooling and heating demand that can be easily met by on-site renewable energy sources. In this webinar, you'll learn about the passive house concept with the help of case studies and how it's applicable to warmer climates. Um, to discuss this topic, we have experts from the Passive House Institute. Let me present to you. Um, Jessica, Jessica is a physicist at the Passive, Passive House Institute. Her areas of expertise include energy efficient building solutions in different climate zones, interrelations between efficiency and renewable energies, and deep energy efficiency for public indoor communities. Campbell is an architect with experience in sustainable building in Spain, China, Australia, and Germany. She works in the area of training as well as building certification and consulting. She work um, um, uh, and she especially focuses on construction projects in emerging countries with warm climates. And uh, Naman Sukhija works in the area of building consultancy and certification with a focus on the passive house market in India. So without further ado, let's begin today's session. Let me transfer the controls. So, thank you so much, Prachi, for the introduction. I am Naman Sukhija. And we are here to introduce the Passive House Standard, which is an international concept for high performance buildings. The aim of the standard is to provide highest indoor comfort and very low operational cost and energy. Here in the slide, you can see some example projects. The first one is from Darmstadt, and the middle one is from Dubai, UAE. And the one in the right is from China. So the journey started as a research residential project in Germany to prove the concept. It was a very successful project planted 30 years back. The project was the seed for the growth of passive house concept around the world. So these are some examples from the passive houses around the world. And you can notice that they have different shapes, sizes, materials, and even uses. So the building on the top right, it's a educational institution in South Korea. The one right be below that, it's a, it's a museum in Germany. 
The one below that, it's a office building, a retrofitted office building in France. The one on the top left, it's a multifamily residential building in Berlin. So here's the map of certified projects around the world. Passive House offers certification for new buildings as certified Passive House, and for refurbished, refurbished buildings as NFIT certified retrofit. As of beginning of this year, there are more than 23.5 lakh square meter treated flow area of the certified Passive Houses around the world. So the Institute, Passive House Institute or PHI, it is situated in Darmstadt, Germany. It's an independent research institute founded in 1996 by Dr. Wolfgang Heiss. So it has several wings, including building certification and consultancy, component certification and consultancy, professional training and education, passive house tools for energy modeling, specially designed PH and PHPP, Passipedia, which is an online knowledge resource, uh, knowledge and network sharing, uh, networking and knowledge sharing through International Passive House Association, known as EFA and International Passive Houses Conference. So as per a study by professors from Joint Global Research Institute, USA, and IM Ahmedabad, the share of space cooling alone is expected to be 60% of the total energy demand, as the energy required for space cooling is expected to increase by 29 times from 2005 to 2095. So the question arises, do we have enough resources to meet this demand on site? For most of the uh, existing buildings in India, it's nearly impossible to meet this demand solely through renewables on site. As an approach to net zero, making the buildings more efficient first and then adding the renewables is known to be the most cost efficient strategy. Due to the increase in urbanization, more and more high rise buildings are coming in India, which also brings the question of available space for the installation of renewables. Moreover, to make the buildings reliable or renewable energy reliable, we need energy storage along with it. So as the building energy demand increases, the price and the area required for energy storage also increases. So the passive houses can reduce the energy required for space cooling by up to 80% than a conventional building. The concept revolves around the five principles to keep the building comfortable all around the year, continuous insulation, windows with very low heat transfer coefficient and a suitable shading, one continuous layer of air tightness to avoid any leakages, uh, efficient ventilation system with heat or humidity recovery depending on the climate, and we also account thermal bridges. My colleague Camille will explain these solutions in detail later. So Passive House Standard has performance goals which are adapted to every climate, fixed criteria for heating, which can be met by meeting the requirement for heating demand or heating load. For cooling, the demand is a combination of sensible demand and latent demand, which varies with the climate. We take into account that in some climates, there's a long cooling period and an additional dehumidification demand. A tightness of the building to determine the resistance of the building envelope against any leakages. And the criteria for primary energy, because that is directly related to the energy generation and CO2 emissions. So with passive houses, the operational energy is so low that it becomes much more easier to meet the rest of the demand using renewables, on-site or nearby renewables, which makes passive houses as an effective solution for net zero approach. So because energy efficiency and renewables are such a great combination, we promote this combination by two more classes, plus and premium. So classic is the basic passive house. And when you move towards premium, you need to add renewables and make your building more efficient. So a lot of people ask us that, why should I opt for passive houses when I'm already following ECBC or Eco Samita, commonly known as ECBC residential? So as also mentioned in these quotes, they are minimum energy performance standards. Passive House further improves the energy efficiency and complements ECBC or Eco Nivas Samita. A building meeting the Passive House standard automatically meets many of the ECBC requirements and some other uh, energy related criteria for some other building rating systems as, as well. And unlike many other building rating systems, Passive Houses extensively assesses the performance before and after the completion of the project to avoid any performance gap and assure the highest quality standards. So Passive House Plus building is 
equal to or nearly equal to net zero energy building. And passive house plus building is usually a, a passive house premium is usually a net plus energy building. So some of the passive house standard advantages are that it is based on the building physics concepts and there's no limitation to climate type and building design. Currently, we have certified single family houses, multi-family houses, hospitals, hotels, office buildings, museums, educational institutions, and many more. So our first priority is the comfort for the occupants. And passive houses have consistent surface and air temperature. Considering the air quality index in major cities like New Delhi, Mumbai, and now even Bengaluru, and due to the current situation due to COVID-19, where we had to or are still spending so much time indoors, it has made us realize the importance of having fresh and clean air inside the building. And as the size of the cooling system considerably reduces, and they are very low operational cost, passive houses are economically viable during their life cycle. So I invite my colleague Jessica to present about the comfort limit in passive houses. Hello, thank you very much, Naman, for that introduction um, and overview to the Passive House Standard and the Passive House Institute. Um, my name is Jessica Grove Smith. I will continue in a second. Naman, I think we've um, changed the view. Can you go back to the actual presentation to the slides? Just restart the, the presentation. Perfect. Thank you very much. So this is the, the slide you finished off with showing the benefits of the passive house buildings um, and what I want to spend a little bit more time on right now with you is to talk about the topic of health and comfort within buildings before um, for the second part of our presentation Camille will take over and speak in more detail to how we actually achieve the passive house standard how we implement it and achieve those energy savings so the reason I want to talk about this topic of health and comfort is because it is extremely important um, the whole purpose of buildings is to provide shelter, so we need to make sure that they are designed very well to, to do so. Um, obviously, in terms of energy efficiency, the best way to reduce or to, to um, reduce our energy needs would be not to have any air conditioning at all. And to a certain extent that is possible, but climates are very warm, get very hot, and there are certainly limits. Um, in terms of energy needs, there's a big difference whether we design our buildings to 28 degrees or to 22 degrees. So the question of where is the comfort limit and what temperature do we design our buildings to be air conditioned to is a fundamental design choice. It's a widely discussed topic, sometimes controversially, so we wanted to make sure to spend some time within this webinar to address um, how the Passive House uh, standard deals with this. Um, comfort is a complicated topic, um, especially when it comes to hot conditions. There are many, many influencing factors, the main one being uh, temperature, air temperature specifically, but also radiative temperature, humidity and air movement. And then the right combination of those parameters depends on the clothing you're wearing or the activity, whether you're sitting at a desk or whether you're more active. Um, and we want to find the right parameters. ASHRAE 55 that you can see a screenshot on this slide is the go-to reference for thermal comfort definitions um, and there's also the ISO 7730. There are two main methods um, to approach thermal comfort which are described in the ASHRAE standard. The first one I want to mention which is uh, called the adaptive comfort method and that applies only for free running buildings. So essentially for buildings that don't have any active cooling. And the idea here, as you can see in the graph, is that people will accept and feel comfortable with higher temperatures the hotter it is outside. Um, so as the most extreme in this graph, when it goes up to 32 degrees outside, 90% of people will be happy and will accept temperatures up to 30 degrees. That's the concept and the idea of the, of the adaptive comfort method um, for free running building without active air conditioning. Now, in contrast to that, um, we have um, the ASHRAE 55 standard also includes an alternative method, which is called the so-called predicted mean vote method, PMV method, which applies to air conditioned spaces. And as you can see in this graph, in that case, the comfort threshold is quite a bit lower and it's largely independent of the outdoor conditions. Um, so it leads to a maximum temperature condition of around 25 degrees Celsius. And this approach, this method, 
is based on a lot of controlled experiments and field studies and basically um, was developed based on a, on a heat balance calculation of the human body to see where is the right balance, where uh, does the, the heat balance of the body adjust um, and still feels comfortable. And that limit it is, it is around 25 degrees. So what, what this comparison between the adaptive comfort and the, the PMV method shows us um, it's, it indicates that people, yes, they may accept and tolerate higher temperatures in a free running building um, when it is hot outside, but they do prefer lower temperatures if they are given the choice and if there is the means of air conditioning. And so 25 degrees um, is uh, the comfort level based on the scientific approach and field studies. Uh, this is also the approach taken by the international study ISO 7730. So this is also an approach that we choose for the passive house standard um, based on the reasoning I gave you in the previous slides. The passive house standard is based on fixed temperature limits for comfort. So for heating, we have 20 degrees um, as a minimum temperature and for cooling um, during summer, during hot seasons, we have 25 degrees as a maximum limit. Um, a certain overheating frequency is admissible, but we design buildings, the passive house standard is aimed um, and it designs building to achieve a high comfort level of 25 degrees. Acknowledging the impact that air movement has on comfort, we do in some cases allow higher uh, temperatures up to 27.5 degrees um, if there is guarantee of air sealing, uh, of sealing fans, sorry, so sufficient air movement. What I also just want to mention as a side note here is that the passive house standard also looks specifically at a humidity limit and calculates the, the building's dehumidification. Um, so we need to make sure we have enough dehumidification in a building. That's not only important for comfort, um, but it is also critical in terms of preventing constructional damage um, from high humidity levels. So that the topic of humidity is something that is fundamentally integrated into the passive house standard. Now, the reason why I took the time or we took the time to speak to you a little bit more about comfort is because these comfort conditions, whether we design our building to be free running without air conditioning or whether we design it actually to um, specific temperatures of 28 or 25 degrees, um, lays the very foundation of our design decisions for buildings. So in hot climates, we ultimately, we have the choice do we either optimize for free running building with naturally conditioned space um, that will ultimately have similar conditions to the outdoors? Um, there's a lot of tradition here, and if it's done well, they can provide acceptable and good comfortable conditions. But this definitely has its limits, and especially with the topic of urbanization, hot climates in cities, uh, it has its limits, and this approach um, is not, not feasible anymore in the long run. So all the alternative is approach is that we say from the very beginning, hang on, let's optimize our buildings to provide high comfort, but with as little amount of air conditioning as we, as we can, as we can achieve. So in that case, we not only have a guarantee of higher levels of uncomfort, but we also provide protection from heat waves and we provide resilience for future climate conditions, which we all know are predicted to increase. It's going to get warmer and warmer um, as, as the years go by. Um, some more reasons why this is so important is um, I think if we step, step back one second, um, we should all reflect that comfort is not or should not be a matter of luxury. It is also a matter of health, health and equity. People do aim for colder conditions for various reasons, for comfort, but also for health. And they will run and they will install air condition uh, when it's affordable and feasible. And what you can see here in this, this image um, I think is, is the picture that we're all familiar with. Typical buildings that were not designed for energy efficiency, but people will add air conditioning as soon as they can. And that is the most inefficient solution um, that we can all imagine. In this case, even with an open window, letting in the hot and humid air from the outside. Um, so if we continue down that path um, with buildings not being designed for energy efficiency, then we run a risk of more and more air conditioning being stored, which will, con which will lead to very high cooling demands on the overall um, and continue on the path of predicted increase of um, cooling demands overall. To explain this a little bit more and to give you an idea of the numbers that we're talking about, I want to uh, show you some um, a study that we did, which basically compares the energy needs of an example multifamily building in the climate of New Delhi. So what you see here in the climate conditions of today, 
Um, the passive house is the blue dot at the very bottom, which has a total predicted cooling demand of about 50 kilowatt hours per square meter in a year. Now, if we, uh, if we compare that to the cooling needs of a baseline building, if that were conditioned to the same 25 degrees, it would need four times as much, so that's this difference here, four times as much energy uh, to be able to provide the same comfort level. Even if that baseline building is operated at slightly less comfort, it still needs substantially more energy than if we've designed to the highly efficiency passive house standard from the very beginning. And now what is an interesting additional thought here is the whole topic of resilience. If we model these buildings in future climate conditions, and these are projections, we don't know exactly how they will pan out. Uh, so this indicates the range of, of more severe climate conditions or not so severe. Um, but we will see the passive house uh, provides resilience. So the cooling demand increases slightly, but not so much. Whereas if we continue to build buildings that are not as energy efficient and don't allow um, for very efficient cooling systems, then we run a risk that the cooling needs will simply increase and increase and increase, um, which obviously um, causes us not only problems in terms of climate mitigation and, and um, greenhouse gas emissions, um, but also increased concerns about energy supply um, infrastructures um, and everything that goes along with it. So everything we've spoken to you about so far, I hope has managed to explain a little bit why we do what we do um, and why um, there's a big opportunity here um, going down the route of Passive House and focusing on, on highly energy efficient buildings. Obviously, um, seeing buildings where this has been put into practice is the most convincing and actually shows this is not just theory, this is reality. So before I pass on again um, to Naman and to Camille to talk more about technical details, we want to share a video with you uh, from a project that was built in Sri Lanka. It's a retrofit project um, built or retrofitted to the Passive House Standard. It's a short um, YouTube video we want to share with you. Um, and I also want to point out that the architect, Jordan Parnas, uh, kindly agreed to join us at the webinar today and is available um, for questions if we have time for this later on. So Prachi, if you'd like to start the YouTube video. Sure, sure, I'll do that. Thank you. It should be running in a minute. We're here today in Colombo, Sri Lanka, where behind me is one of our most exciting and interesting passive house projects. The Star Garment Product Development Center is a combination office and industrial building where both design, sourcing, pattern making, and sewing happen under one roof. In South Asia, there's a long history of garment manufacturing, where working conditions in local factories are often hot, humid, noisy, and poorly ventilated. JPDA's work on the Star Garment Innovation Center uses passive house standards to renovate an old factory to increase sustainability, reduce energy use and expenses, and improve the lives of employees. Passive House is a holistic set of design principles and efficiency standards that strictly regulate the amount of energy a building can use, guaranteeing a very high level of comfort for the people inside. Its basic principles include proper insulation to reduce heat transfer, an airtight enclosure to prevent leakages, high performance windows and doors, and an energy efficient heat recovery ventilation system. The Star Garment Building is located in the heart of Sri Lanka, just above the equator, where the tropical climate presents challenges to designing efficient, sustainable, and comfortable buildings. Renovating the old structure, rather than demolishing a building from scratch, dramatically reduced waste, carbon emissions, and fossil fuel consumption. The existing industrial shed was first stripped down to its bare steel skeleton and concrete slab on grade. Modifications were then made to the walls and structure, and the renovation included a high-performance heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system, a complete air barrier, continuous layers of insulation on all sides, high-performance windows and doors, and an insulated roof assembly with solar panels. Energy use is projected to drop by 70%, with a 90% reduction in dehumidification energy and a 73% reduction in heat pump energy. 
Employees enjoy year-round comfort in a workspace that provides filtered fresh air, abundant natural light, low humidity, and consistent temperatures. Studies by researchers at Harvard University show that employees with access to properly ventilated air boast a 60% better job performance, have 30% fewer headaches and respiratory complaints, and sleep better at night. At JPDA, we are uniquely qualified in overseeing Passive House projects. We stand out for our close collaboration with a team of the world's leading sustainable experts and engineers. Unlike other sustainability standards like LEED, Passive House is evaluated through comprehensive performance testing before and after each project is complete to ensure the building holds up to the highest standards. With the Star Garments project, JPDA was able to use our expertise in sustainable methods of design to produce a state-of-the-art project that can be replicated on any building in any climate to make significant advancements in sustainability, energy efficiency, and quality of life for millions of people around the world. So thank you so much, Jessica. Can you see the presentation now? I think you need to restart to the the presentation. You yeah, perfect. Good thank to go. You. So this project in Sri Lanka is being used for two years now, and the data also confirms the same energy use as expected. And we have collected the monitoring data for many other projects in the past to confirm that the passive house work as expected in the design phase. So for a successful passive house project, it is important to have a committed team of passive house experts, reliable design tools in the schematic design phase, and highly efficient components. So for the design tools, design PH is a sketch of paste tool for preliminary analysis, which is then exported to PHPP or planning or passive house planning package, uh, which is an Excel based tool for detailed energy modeling. And we work around the local partners to develop the market in term of expertise and components. So it is important to have the locally available passive house components to reduce the investment cost as well. So you can see the certified components around the world and on the link, you can find the certified components. Thanks to ECBC standard and BEE, the building energy efficiency market in India is growing rapidly now, but there is still a lack of energy efficient components in India. Once the components are manufactured locally, additional investment costs will progressively drop as we have also noticed in Europe and North America. It is also important to develop the market locally from the environmental point of view. And this also complements the Make in India initiative and the Atman Nirbhar Bharat Abhiyan by current Prime Minister of India. So for component certification, the manufacturers share their ideas regarding the component. Passive House Institute evaluates the component for different characteristics and consults them to achieve the certification for the respective climate. Uh, now I invite my colleague Kamil to explain the solutions for Passive House standard. All right, thank you very much, Naman. Um, can you also give me the control, please? Yeah, I just gave you the controls. Great. Okay, looks like fine. So now I'm gonna discuss a bit the solutions that we will need for energy efficient buildings that also provide comfortable indoor conditions, as well as better air quality. So as you can see on this map, in most regions of India, we will have a cooling demand. There's gonna be some heating demand in the region around Srinagar and a little bit in the composite climate, but it's mostly gonna be about cooling. So that's why I'm gonna present many solutions to reduce the cooling demand. So 
Before I go into details, I'd like to give a bit more context about our approach in hot climates. There are two main approaches that my colleague Jessica mentioned a bit earlier. The first one is the traditional approach, which is to have a very open building and to foster air circulation. The great thing with this uh, strategy is that it's free. But the downside is it really depends on the outdoor conditions. So if, you, if it's very hot, humid outside, or if you are in a dense city, you may not get the air patterns that you are planning for. And thus you may end up with high temperatures and humidity levels inside of your building. Now the question is, would you be happy with such conditions? And as Jessica mentions, it looks like more and more people are aiming at higher comfort conditions, probably because they're getting used to air conditioning in their cars, in the shops, in their office. So as soon as they can afford to buy a split unit and to operate it, they will do so. But putting such a split unit on a traditional building and operating it on a very leaky and inefficient building is just not ideal because it's not efficient nor comfortable. So if you'd like to have like lower temperatures inside but without wasting too much energy then there is an alternative approach which is to separate the inside from the building from the exterior. You can still open the windows but you wouldn't leave them open all the time. And with this approach, you then manage to have better comfort um, at a lower energy demand, and you can also avoid like this peak power problems for cooling. So what do we do in detail? Well, first, we limit the internal and the external heat loads, because the need for cooling relates to unwanted heat in our building. The way we reduce internal load is by using more efficient appliances, mainly. And the way we reduce external heat loads is by using a certain amount of insulation, high performance glazing, shading, air tightness, and a ventilation unit with heat and humidity recovery, depending on the climate. Once these solutions have been applied, to further reduce the cooling demand, you can apply passive cooling strategies. And one very famous one is to open the windows at night. But this is only helpful if the temperatures outside and the humidity levels are less high than what you want to have inside. Otherwise, it's counterproductive. Once you've applied all these strategies, if there's still some remaining cooling demand, it's going to be much lower, but you will need some active cooling strategies. And as we have seen in some projects in Mexico, then you will only need one split unit in the case of Passive House instead of for the wall flats instead of one split unit per room like in a traditional building that would be inefficient. So now I'm going to speak about all these strategies with more details and I'll start with insulation. So insulation does not create heat it's just slowing down the heat transfer between two spaces at different temperatures so that's why it's also a useful strategy in hot climates. There are several materials available. You can choose between synthetic insulation, mineral insulation, or ecological insulation. Now, which material you will choose mainly depends on the availability of the product and also on the characteristics you will need. So do you need your insulation to be compression resistant, to be humidity resistant, to be recyclable or have a low conductivity, for instance? The big question is how much insulation will you need? And of course, it will first depend on the conductivity of the material, because if you have a low conductivity, then you will need less insulation for the same result. But it will also very much depend on the climate and the compactness of your project. You can see on this slide some results from a study we are currently doing for GIZ India. And I'll come back later to this study again. But for now, I'd like you to notice that in the climate of Bengaluru, we need much less insulation than in the warm and humid climate of Bhubaneswar. And what's also interesting to notice is that if you have a more compact building like the standalone tower 1.6, then you also need less insulation than if you have a less compact building like 1.2b. So this insulation layer, we will have it all around our building and below, but it will be interrupted at some places. And that's when we're gonna talk about thermal bridges. So in conventional buildings, these thermal bridges, they are located at the balcony slab, the junction between components, between assemblies. If you think of the insulation layer as a defensive wall, 
whenever there is a gap in the insulation layer, heat will be able to flow um, uh, more easily towards the inside or towards the outside. So we'd like to avoid these weak points because they will increase our energy demand. especially in cold climates where the difference in temperature between the inside and the outside can be quite high. Now, how can we fix this thermal bridge problem? Well, we can do it through better detailing. And I'll give you some concrete example that is quite common. It's the balcony example. We need these balconies because they provide shading, which is really useful in hot climates. But instead of having a conventional balcony, that's a slab that is continuously going from the inside of the building towards the outside without interruption, we could rather have some balcony on a separated self-supporting structure so that you would only have a few penetration going through the insulation layer instead of having a big linear thermal bridge over the wall width of the balcony. And that would be the solution that is shown on the picture left. Now you could have another cost-effective solution on the right. That's a solution that we used for an office in Qingdao. It would be to have the balcony slab separated from the slab of the building. And you would have this balcony slab on a few consoles. Now these consoles, they would interrupt the insulation layer, but there would only be a few consoles. And you can have, as you can see on this image, the wall insulation layer continuously going through um, from one story to another. There's still space for it. So there will just be a few thermal bridges instead of one continuous one. This insulation layer will also be interrupted by windows, but thanks to a certain number of pain, thanks to specific coatings, and thanks to insulated frames, we will manage to keep most of the heat outside. So whether you need single glazing, double or triple glazing will mainly depend, again, on the climate and the compactness of your project. If I remember well, right now in the study we are doing, the buildings we modeled until now, which are multifamily buildings, needed single glazing with solar protection in Bengaluru, while they needed double to triple glazing in the other Indian climates. Another information that is important is the G value. That's telling you how much solar radiation will enter your building through the glazing. And in a hot climate, we want to limit this as much as possible. So that's why we will aim at a G value that is around 30 to 40%. And the last information I'd like to highlight on this slide is regarding the glazing edge. So it's um, commonly, um, so currently in India, uh, mostly aluminum spacers are used. And it would be better actually to use um, plastic spaces because then the heat transfer at this glazing edge will be lower because plastic has a lower conductivity than aluminum. As I've said before, we want to keep the solar loads out and the first thing we need to do is to design suitable window sizes. So we want to have windows that are big enough to provide enough daylighting, but we also don't want to overdo it, right? To do a glazed box in the middle of the desert is not really climate responsive. And once you have agreed on the size of your window, then you can think about shading. And exterior shading is the most efficient. You can choose between fixed exterior shading and movable exterior shading. What's great with fixed shading, like for instance a roof overhang, is that it doesn't depend on the user behavior. While with blinds, people need to think that they need to get the blinds down when the sun comes in. You could of course have some additional sensors so that the blinds get automatically down when the sun hits the glazing. But this would require some additional investment cost. The next point on our agenda is air tightness. We need a layer that prevents airflow from the inside to us the outside and vice versa. Because we want to avoid drafts, pollutant entrance, and we want to provide an enhanced air quality and noise protection, and also to protect the building envelope. So in short, we need one continuous airtight layer, not a few more or less airtight layers. We just need one that should be continuous. And in Europe, it's mostly inside, but in warm and humid climates, it can actually be more beneficial to have it outside so that you prevent the 
so that you prevent the um, exterior uh, airflow from entering, so the hot and humid airflow from entering your building assembly. How do we ensure that we create an airtight surface? So first of all, we need some airtight surfaces, and then we need to seal the connections between these surfaces, for instance, with airtight tape. And lastly, we also need to take care of the penetrations to ensure that the penetrations of cables and pipes are um, airtightly connected to the surfaces. So which material you will choose mainly depends on the type of the construction you will have. I believe in India it's most common to have solid construction. And in that case, you could use concrete as an airtight material. Masonry in itself is not airtight, so you would need some interior plaster on top of it. Now, if you have to deal with timber construction, then in that case, you would use some wooden composite boards or airtight membranes. And remember to have airtight tapes for the joints and to take care of the penetrations. So once you're done with this airtight layer, it's very important to test whether your building is really airtight or not. And you would do this with an airtightness equipment as shown on the picture. Now, this equipment is not common in India yet, but I understood that SEPT University recently acquired one. So I hope that this whole topic of airtightness testing and air quality will become one more, more important in the coming years in India. So what we do with this airtightness testing is we put a pressure difference between the inside and the outside of the building of 50 Pascal. And then we check that the air, that the air change to the leakages of the buildings is lower than 0.6 per hour. To give you some comparison, in an existing building, the air change could be between three and five air changes per hour. Now, air tightness goes hand in hand with ventilation. Especially when you have an airtight building, you need some suitable ventilation strategy. Now, we need, first of all, ventilation because human beings, they need continuously fresh air to breathe. But we also need ventilation to limit air humidity for comfort, health, and structural integrity reasons. We also need ventilation to avoid the concentration of pollutants like CO2, like volatile organic compounds that could come from your furnitures. And we also need ventilation to limit odor nuisance from the kitchen or for the bathroom, for instance. The question is, how do we provide enough fresh air to the building occupants? Because it won't be enough to I mean, even if you have a very leaky building, not enough air will go through the leaks so that people will have enough fresh air, especially if you consider the high occupants density that we can observe in flats in India. So there are two main solutions that come into question, which are window ventilation and mechanical ventilation. Which one you will recommend mainly depends on the climate and on the context of the project. So if, for instance, we are in Bhubaneswar, and you open the windows, you will get all the heat and the humidity that will come inside of your building. While if you use a ventilation unit with heat and humidity recovery, you can prevent most heat and humidity from entering your building, and you will also get filtered air quality. So the way this ventilation with humidity recovery works, well, there are two strategies. You could either use a counterflow heat exchanger with water permeable membrane, or you could also use some rotary wheel with sorption surfaces. So the way this counterflow heat exchanger works is you have several layers of plates. And between two plates, you will have the outdoor air that will go through. And between the plates above and below, you will have the extract air that will go through so that there is no mixing of the air flows but there is an exchange of heat and humidity. The outdoor air is giving most of its heat, its heat and humidity to the extract air so that your supply air is less warm and less humid than the outdoor air. And the way the rotary wheel works is quite similar. It's a wheel that is turning and turning and it's getting heated up by the outdoor air and passes this heat and this humidity to the exhaust air. So we've seen now several, we see now several, okay, <laughs> I will manage to show this slide. 
previous. Okay, so we've seen now several solutions that you can use to reduce the cooling demand, but there is no fixed set of parameters to get to the pacifier standard. What solution you will recommend mainly depends on your specific project. So in some cases, it may be better to recommend more insulation and double glazing, while in some cases, it might be better to recommend less insulation but triple glazing. And what's great is that you can try all these variants in the PHPP and you can enter the cost and so on, so you can see which solution is best for your specific case. And once you've applied all these solutions, and you've applied passive cooling, if it was possible, and you still have a remaining cooling demand, then in that case, and as you can see um, on the slides, this is a project in a Mediterranean warm climate, you will have a much lower cooling demand than in an existing building. And what's also interesting to see is that this demand will be continuous, whereas you have significant peak cooling load in the existing building, which are much harder to cover and can create stress on the electricity grid. Now, which solutions would we recommend for India? Well, in most Indian climates, you will have high humidity levels, whether it's over the whole year or over a few months. And what you need to understand is that in high performance buildings, we are reducing the sensible cooling demand quite a lot. So your, air, your split unit will have to work less and thus it will provide less dehumidification. So there, there is a risk of higher humidity levels in high performance buildings. And to avoid this, we first need to reduce the humidity loads by using air tightness, by using a ventilation unit with humidity recovery, and by using a recirculation cooking hood instead of extract fans in the kitchen. And once you have reduced these humidity loads, then we recommend you to use solutions with separate cooling and dehumidification. So some solutions that are available currently on the market are, for instance, mini split units and high efficiency dehumidifier. Alternatively, you could also use supply air and dehumidifier and also add a wrap around heat pipe so this would help us to basically pre-cool the supply air before it gets dehumidified and cooled down in the cooling coil. And when this air comes out again, it gets reheated passively again with this wraparound heat pipe. That's a solution that was used in the Sri Lanka project we've seen in the video a bit earlier on. Another solution that might be mentioned is the concrete co-activation with dehumidifier. But this is not a solution we would recommend because it has a lower efficiency and there is also a risk that the humidifier breaks down or especially if it's a cheap dehumidifier that it doesn't control the humidity levels adequately so you might end up with a tropical shower in your office because you will have hot humid air that will get in touch with that will get in contact with a cool slab and thus you will have the formation of condensation or mold which are both things we'd like to avoid. And the last solution I'd like to mention is it would be great if we could have like all this in one, split unit, uh, in one unit. So if we could have the ventilation, the cooling, the humidification and heating if needed in one energy efficient unit. And that's something my colleagues are working on right now together with some manufacturers. So we hope that some, some products will be available. But in the meantime, I'm going to finish this presentation with a bit of information about the study we are realizing on type designs for energy efficient residential buildings. So it is a study that is supported by GIZ India and done on behalf of the Bureau of Energy Efficiency. And we are doing this study together with Ashok Bilal Architects, with Lead Consultancy and Engineering Services and KPMG India. The aim of this study is to improve typical building designs to five efficiency levels and then to make all this building documentation available for free on an online platform. So what was first done is there were five cities that were selected to represent the five Indian climate zones and then five prototypes out of the 25 prototypes were selected to be optimized to the fifth energy efficiency level which is the passive house level. 
So while the, the efficiency level one to four are offering solutions that are in line with the current scenario in India, current context, the um, level five or the passive house level is offering a high performance solution for the scenario where there will be a switch to air conditioning in the entire flat. So for each building, we are entering the geometry and the components into the passive house planning package. And then we're changing these components until we reach the passive house certification criteria. Then as a second step, we model these buildings another time, but this time using project specific boundary conditions as defined by the team. That's to say we're using a different occupant density, different domestic hot water demand, different use of electrical appliances and internal heat gains. And lastly, we do a life cycle cost analysis. So we look at the capital costs, the investment costs, we look at the operational costs, the maintenance costs, the residual value of the components. And that's helping us to decide whether we would rather recommend 150 millimeter of insulation or 125 millimeter of insulation. And on this slide, you can see some preliminary results for the building 1.2 in the climate of Bhubaneswar. You see that we can reduce the cooling and the primary energy demand to a big extent, which translates in lower operational costs. And thus, this lower operational cost can easily compensate the additional investment cost for higher efficiency over the life cycle of the building. And to finish with, some more graphs that we will provide for each variant. So on the left graph, you can see the sensible cooling demand reduction. The two first bars are about the base case, while the two next bars are about the passive house case. And you can notice here that after we have reduced the heat loads coming through the walls, coming well to the envelope, coming through the windows, coming through the fresh airflow, then we can't really reduce these loads any further because of this orange, well, these internal heat loads that are shown here in orange. And the problem is that once you have efficient appliances, then you can't really reduce these internal heat loads further because they, they are coming from the occupants. So there's not much you can do here. And on the right side, you can see that we also managed to reduce the humidification demand thanks to better air tightness, thanks to ventilation with humidity recovery, and thanks to um, the recirculation cooking hood, as mentioned previously. So we hope that you're looking forward to the release of the study and that it will help you to foster high performance buildings in India. Back to you, Jessica. We can't hear you, Jessica. <laughs> Thank you for letting me know. Can you hear me now? Yeah, much Perfect. better. Perfect. Thanks. OK, thank you, Camille, for um, uh, your detailed explanation of how we achieve the high energy efficiency of, of Passive House, the technologies that are needed. We shared a lot of information with you, and there's a lot more information to share. Um, we're, we've already spent almost an hour, so I just want to spend a few more minutes wrapping up, summarizing the main points and making sure there's opportunity for you to reach out, to follow up, to learn more and to connect. So the topic of this webinar was Passive House's approach to NZEB. NZEB net zero energy buildings obviously entail energy efficiency and renewables. You will have noticed that we didn't speak that much about renewables on purpose. Um, we focus entirely on that idea, on the notion that we need to prioritize energy efficiency, energy efficiency first, and that will make it so much easier and simpler and provide us with opportunities to reach our net zero targets and fully renewable energy supply. As um, Naman pointed out very early on in the presentation very nicely, is that the Passive House standard is a voluntary standard with very high energy efficiency, basically goes beyond the minimum standards that codes currently provide and leads us on that way up here on the race towards net zero under full energy supply. So just summarizing briefly the Passive House approach. Um, it's a whole house approach. Um, so we design the building for high comfort, for high energy efficiency. 
Um, also looking at cost effectiveness in terms of the life cycle costs, comfort and health. We have very clear performance targets that we work to and we have a clear quality assurance process from the very early design all the way to construction. So the aim is to achieve high comfort with high indoor air qualities, which we know now more than ever how important it is. But we do that with as little energy as possible to make sure um, our buildings don't have immense um, impact on climate change. Um, and by doing that, we enable a fully renewable energy supply. So efficiency first as a highest priority and then renewable energy supply. Now we, as the Passive House Institute, are based in Germany um, in a city called Darmstadt, but we work uh, with partners, with organizations around the world. And we do that through the network called the International Passive House Association. You can see the logo here and you can see the link down here. So I encourage you uh, to go to that website, have a look and reach out to the International Passive House community. As Research Institute, we are based in Darmstadt in Germany. Um, but we work in close collaboration. And this map here shows some of our partners worldwide. The idea is we need to think globally. We all have this climate challenge ahead of us that we want to tackle. And we know that the building sector plays an extremely important and crucial role in this, but we need to act locally. So the more we manage to exchange our experiences, learn from another, but implement that in the context, in the local context, um, the better um, and the more opportunities there are. So it's one big event where the Passive House community gets together every year to exchange experiences, latest projects, up-to-date research, and that is the International Passive House Conference. It takes place once a year. This year it was going to be in Berlin in Germany, but given the current uh, situation, we've moved online. And to a certain extent, that gives us opportunities to involve more people and have more of an international collaboration and, and information exchange. So there will be many lectures, um, uh, which is the main content of this conference. One example is Camille, for example, will give more detailed um, explanations about the project, the very exciting project that we are doing in collaboration with GIZ and our um, other partners in India. There's also an exhibition of products. Um, there are networking opportunities and more building examples. Now I'm very excited um, as this opportunity um, for this webinar and as this opportunity to really bring our expertise and exchange experiences with you to be able to make a special offer um, for people who have participated in this webinar. You can reach out, go to the website and log on with this discount code PH Passive House for India and you will get a substantial discount. We do that because we really want to encourage and we want to support um, the uptake of, of um, these ideas of passive house, the passive house approach in the context of India, and knowing that the market yet um, is, is still fairly, fairly on. There's still a lot of work to do in terms of the knowledge, sharing the knowledge and making the components available. Um, so coming towards the end, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, I hope we've been able to give you some, some insight into what the passive house approach is, what the passive house standards um, stands for. And we'd love to hear from you. Our email addresses are listed on this on this slide. And we'd love to work with you jointly on bringing more Passive House projects to India. It's every single project can cause a ripple effect and cause more people to get inspired and build a better world. As a final slide, here are just some further information, which I will leave up on the slide as we move into the discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you also very much to Prachi and her team um, for hosting and enabling this event. Um, and we look forward to the to the discussions. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks, and thanks, Norman. So we have quite a few questions coming in. So um, let's take them up. Um, sure. So, Norman and Camille, you also want to share your camera so we can all answer the questions together. So here's a great question, you know, in the light of the current uh, global scenario, um, how are passive houses performing in um, terms of ensuring healthy spaces and preventing transmission of the virus, you know, and um, so would it be possible to uh, talk about that? Yes, it's a very good and very up-to-date question and very important. Um, 
so passive house as can be explained one of the fundamental aspects of passive house is that we provide fresh air all the time we make sure that there is a fresh air supply one of the risks that has come as part of this discussion with the with the pandemic and the health risks is um, um, that we need we need a lot of fresh air we need that ventilation and passive houses because they are so highly energy efficient and because the cooling loads are so low we don't need any additional recirculation more so we Taking away that need for recirculation um, takes away a big risk of um, trapping kind of viruses and bacteria within the building. So actually the whole passive house approach of having a continuous fresh air supply um, and no need for air recirculation is, a, is a very much aligned um, with the current health challenges that we're facing. Thanks, Jessica. Um, so here's another question about the case study that you showed. Um, so, you know, how long has it been since the Star Garment Center has been in operation and how's the operation performance been? Could you talk about that? The building has been uh, operated since last two years and we also showed the monitoring data for the same project and it shows the building is operated exactly as it was expected to be. Yeah, okay. so it's still meeting the passive house standard and it will in the future for sure. Um, and uh, is, can you talk about green envelope retrofit or like passive house uh, retrofit uh, for the envelope in India and uh, you know how that that can be executed? Camille, do you want to take this one about retrofit? I'm having trouble if you don't mind if you could re repeat your question because <laughs> yeah. I'm having trouble to understand you. Sure. So the question is, um, how um, you know, what are the guidelines for retrofitting building envelopes in the Indian context? If you could talk about that. Um, so we have guidelines according to climate. Uh, so we recommend some components, some components uh, depending on which climate your project will be located in. But we don't have no specific. Uh, recommendations um, for retrofit in India as we will have now for the new residential buildings. But exactly. it's an ongoing research so and there's a lot of uh, in takings that we can um, use from our study for new buildings and also apply with some changes to existing buildings. So to add to that, um, entirely agree with, with Camille, so the concept basically stays the same, it's the whole house approach. Um, so obviously it's much easier for new builds, but for retrofit buildings, you have to look at the individual case and deal with um, the construction and design you already have. But the concepts that Camille explained um, in so much detail um, are, are the same. So basically you would be adding insulation, you would be making sure that the air tightness is improved and so on. Also for the retrofit projects. Right. Um, so moving on to the next question, which is question is um does phi have a method for certifying high efficiency products you know or something um in the pipeline for the indian scenario and as a follow-up question to that um you know are the products that are required for passive house buildings cost effective and can they be used for low cost housing so i hope that's a very okay. long question can you repeat the first part of the question it was about certification of components i just didn't catch which one Yes, so, so does uh, Passive House Institute have a method for certifying high product, high efficiency products in India? Yes, so we do. Um, as Naman introduced as, as part of the presentation, we have um, criteria for component certification and that covers different component. Um, so that covers um, um, detailing solutions, it covers windows, um, it covers ventilation systems and we're working also on criteria for cooling systems. Um, and there are no components yet in India, but we'd be very, very happy to work with manufacturers and encourage the uptake and development of local components. And these um, certification criteria, they are available on our website, so it's very transparent. Just to add to what Jessica said, like, and the components, they are certified for separate climates. So for very hot climate, you have some separate, uh, separate characteristics based on which you certify the component. And as there are uh, climate varies, the criteria varies basically for the components. Got it, got it. Um, so how does Passive House standard address 
traditional teachers of courtyard that are often found in uh, buildings in India. Um, that's the standard recommend courtyards. Um, um, yeah, so it depends a little bit on the specific context and on the climate conditions. Courtyards can be very um, beneficial because they are shaded, they are, provide kind of cool outdoor space. But obviously the building as such is less compact because you have a much more um, much much higher outdoor outdoor surface of the envelope so it depends a little bit on the context there have been um, project designs with courtyards um, basically the passive house concept as such doesn't limit uh, or doesn't restrict your design options but you will see very quickly when you start modeling your building what the benefits and what the disadvantages are of different design choices and I think we have time for one last question. So this one, uh, if the passive house standard applies to high-rise buildings, and what are the challenges of ensuring uh, passive house performance in high-rise buildings? So mm -hmm. just combining two questions. So. Mm -hmm. um, yep. So passive house has been applied to high-rise buildings. Yes, there has been a handful of projects. The first high-rise was a retrofit project in Germany. Um, the most recent high-rises have been in Austria, but also a student dormitory in New York and a social housing project in, in northern Spain. Um, so there have been several high-rise projects. Um, the challenges that we have to deal with are in, in terms of detailing how do we do the air tightness, how do we deal with kind of the stack effect um, but the principles are generally the same. Um, we do model everything within the building. So high rises might need some extra pumping equipment to overcome the, the height difference. That is all included in the overall energy balance. So those are just things that you have to keep in mind overall. The passive house can be applied also for high rise projects. Great. Thank you so much. I think uh, we had time for with these questions, but there are quite a few more coming in. And uh, if, if it's okay, I'll uh, email it to you. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you could uh, pick it up in more detail. Um, mm -hmm. So, so yes, so thanks a lot for today's session. It was really very interesting. Yes, um, going back with so many new ideas about designing buildings for warm climates, you know, so this, this is quite um, a paradigm shift in many ways. Um, so before ending today's session, I just have a couple of announcements uh, very quickly to make. Our next webinar is on the 24th, on the 11th of September. Sorry, there's a typo here. Um, so it's on the 11th of September, and it's on personal thermal comfort systems, and this will be led by Rajan Ravel. And this webinar is going to look at personal thermal comfort systems and how they enable occupants to create desired localized thermal conditions around workstations in offices. And it will cover the different approaches for uh, personal th thermal comfort systems, and also, you know, introduce you to the prescribed metrics and conditions for designing and operating these. Um, and uh, finally, all our webinars, including this one, are recorded and uploaded on our YouTube channel. So please be sure to um, check this out and you'll find uh, recordings of over 33 webinars so far and uh, we'll be uploading this one very soon as well. Lastly, do check out our uh, NZ Knowledge Portal. This is your one-stop site for information in NZ, and you will get access to a host of resources for design, for um, you know, looking up uh, different technological solutions for designing high-performance buildings. So that's for today's session. Thank you so much for joining in. Um, and again, I'd like to thank the speakers for today for taking out their time and putting in the efforts for such a great presentation.